Hello everyone, and welcome back to Alt-Roll's class breakdown series. I'm Bill, admin and instructor for Alt-Roll, and today we're going to finish our class breakdown series that gives you a general overview of all the classes in D&D 5th edition to help you find the one that you want to play. Today, let's look at the Ranger, specialists that train themselves to know the wilderness and the monsters within it. The Ranger is a sentinel of the frontiers, typically working alone to keep the dangers of the wild at bay as humanoids continue to settle further and further away from the safety of civilization. Their familiarity with the wilds as trackers, hunters, and guides imbues them with the same vein of magic that druids tap into, with spells that access the natural power of the wilderness to improve their speed and stealth. While typically shunning large groups once their training is complete, a ranger quickly learns to value others who can carry their own weight, knowing full well that wolves hunt best in packs. This knowledge typically drives them to strike out and join adventuring parties, ensuring their expertise can be put to good use. Mechanically, the ranger is a flexible half-caster, meaning they can cast spells, but gain new slots and spell levels slower than full casters. As such, they need to use their casting to accent traditional martial training. Luckily for the ranger, they come equipped with proficiency in all weapons, light armor, medium armor, and shields, meaning they boast a good array of equipment to work at range or in melee. However, their lack of heavy armor tends to discourage them from staying in the front line for too long. With all this in mind, the ranger's role in the party is typically as a scout or damage dealer, using their skills and spells to further enhance their abilities. To help summarize the ranger and clarify its role, let's go through a quick pros and cons list that I've organized into three main points for each. Starting with the pros, the first is that the ranger deals great damage. Whether in melee or at range, the Ranger gains an array of abilities and spells that increase their damage potential in fun and unique ways. The second main positive of the Ranger is that they have some unique spell options. Despite having less spell resources than other classes due to being a half-caster, the spells the Ranger can take advantage of more than makes up for how little they can cast them. Finally, the third main positive of the Ranger is that they have a great skill set. Through some class abilities, subclass options, and utility spells, the ranger has a plethora of ways to make themselves more skillful, rivaling the rogue in how good they can be at rolling skill checks. With just these pros in mind, the ranger is a skillful damage dealer that has a mix of the fighter's combat capabilities, the druid's spellcasting, and the rogue's skill expertise. However, there are some negatives to the ranger we need to address, the first of which being that the Ranger has few support options. The Ranger does technically have some healing and support available for the party, but being restricted to good berry and lesser restoration won't replace a dedicated cleric or druid for the party. The second main negative of the Ranger is that they are vulnerable. While they do have a good hit dice option at a d10, their inability to restore their own health, mitigate incoming damage, or innately wield heavy armor means the ranger can take a hit or two, but shouldn't be the sole tank that the party is going to be relying on. Finally, the last main negative of the ranger is that they are multiple ability dependent. The ranger requires a high dexterity, constitution, and wisdom to be fully effective at martial combat and spellcasting. While you can get away with neglecting one of these ability scores until higher levels, a low roll during character creation can really hurt the ranger's effectiveness in combat. With the overview laid out and the pros and cons analyzed, let's review the unique class abilities that the ranger earns as they level up. Starting at level 1, the ranger gains the Favored Enemy and Natural Explorer abilities. Favored Enemy lets the ranger choose one type of enemy or two specific humanoid races as a favored enemy. This grants the ranger advantage on survival checks to track these enemies, advantage on intelligence checks to recall information about them, 
and knowledge of one language these enemies speak. One additional favored enemy can be chosen at levels 6 and 14. Natural Explorer lets the ranger choose one type of favored terrain. When making intelligence or wisdom checks related to that terrain, the ranger's proficiency bonus is doubled. There are also a number of passive benefits granted if the ranger is traveling in their favored terrain for at least one hour, such as better tracking, navigation, and more alertness. The ranger can choose one additional terrain type at levels 6 and 10. At level 2, the ranger chooses a fighting style and gains their spell casting. Fighting styles offer minor buffs based on which one is chosen, such as increases to damage, attack rolls, and armor class. The ranger's options are meant to accent either a melee or ranged focused combat style. As for the spell casting, it is very similar to the druid, but we'll need to break it down from here to dive into some of the nuances. Firstly, the ranger is a wisdom caster, meaning their spell attack bonus and spell save DC are both affected by their wisdom score. The ranger starts with no cantrips, but two first level spell slots. They gain second level slots at level 5, third level slots at level 9, fourth level slots at level 13, and finally, fifth level slots at level 17. Spent spell slots are regained upon finishing a long rest. The ranger also does not get access to their full spell list, instead choosing a certain number of spells to know based on their level. This number starts with two spells known at level 2 and increases at higher levels based on the spell's known chart. The ranger can swap out one known spell anytime they level up, but they must only choose spells of the same level for which they have slots. At level 3, the ranger chooses an archetype and gains the primeval awareness ability. Ranger archetypes, aka subclasses, establish what type of lifestyle the ranger embodies. The ranger gains new archetype abilities at levels 7, 11, and 15. We'll go over ranger archetypes in their own section later in the video. Primeval Awareness allows the ranger to spend one ranger spell slot to focus their awareness on the region around them. For one minute per spell level spent, the ranger senses aberrations, celestials, dragons, elementals, fey, fiends, and undead within one mile. If within their favored terrain, the range of this ability is increased to six miles. However, it doesn't reveal how many creatures are around or where they are exactly located. At level four, the ranger gains their first ability score improvement. Ability score improvements add plus two to one ability score or plus one to two ability scores, up to the soft cap of 20. Rangers gain five ability score increases as they level up. And if the DM is using the optional feats rule, you can forego an ability score improvement to take a feat instead. At level 5, the ranger gains extra attack, which lets the ranger attack twice anytime they take the attack action. At level 8, the ranger can move through difficult terrain with no restriction, pass through plants with no restriction, and gains advantage on saving throws against magically created plants that will impede movement. At level 10, the ranger can spend one minute camouflaging themselves to gain a plus 10 to stealth checks when not moving or taking actions. At level 14, the ranger can hide as a bonus action and can't be tracked by non-magical means unless they choose to be. At level 18, the ranger can attack creatures they can't see without having to roll at disadvantage and can detect invisible creatures within 30 feet of them unless the creature is hidden through a stealth check or the ranger is blinded or deafened. Finally, at level 20, the ranger can add their wisdom modifier to an attack or damage roll against their favored enemies. With these base abilities, we can see that the ranger gains a diverse array of abilities that boost up their skills, combat, movement, and navigation, with even further buffs through limited spellcasting options. Next up, let's look at the ranger archetypes the ranger can choose from 
to establish what type of lifestyle they want to embody. There are eight ranger archetypes available to choose from at level three. I'm going to go through them in alphabetical order, but if you want to skip ahead to a subclass you want to know more about, you can use the timestamps in the description to skip ahead to the one that you're interested in. The Beastmaster, as the name suggests, has learned to work with the beasts of the wild, taming them to fight monsters that mutually threaten civilization and the wilderness. When taking this subclass, the Ranger gains a Ranger's Companion that accompanies them in the party and in combat. The Ranger chooses a beast that is medium-sized and has a challenge rating of one quarter or lower. This beast takes its turn on the Ranger's initiative and follows simple commands to the best of its abilities. This companion can die, but if that happens, a new beast can become a companion after magically bonding with the Ranger for eight hours. Further levels in this subclass grant bonus actions to the Beast Companion if it doesn't attack on its turn, the Beast Companion's attacks become magical, the Beast Companion gains an extra attack, and eventually, the Ranger can target both themselves and their Beast Companion when targeting themselves with a spell. The Beastmaster subclass from the Player's Handbook is sorely underpowered as a subclass. Unfortunately, the pool of beasts of a challenge rating of a quarter or lower are not very good, and even with the extra subclass abilities, it will be very vulnerable in combat. However, a modified version of this subclass was put out in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, which fixes a lot of issues players had with the Ranger's companion options. If you want to have a cool pet that accompanies the party and can carry its own in combat, I highly encourage you to use the Primal Companion from Tasha's for the Beastmaster subclass. Otherwise, just ask your DM for a pet and go ahead and skip this subclass. The Drake Warden Ranger has their connection to nature take the form of a drake, gaining the power and companionship of dragons to fulfill their duties. When taking this subclass, the Ranger gains the Thaumaturgy Cantrip, the ability to read, speak, and write Draconic, and a Drake Companion. As an action, the Ranger can summon a Drake once per long rest, which lasts until it or the Ranger are reduced to zero hit points. The Drake acts as a companion that takes its turn after the Ranger in combat, and has its strikes infused with a damage type chosen by the Ranger when summoned. If the Drake has already been summoned once per long rest, the Ranger can expend a spell slot to summon the Drake again. Further levels in this subclass grant the Drake Companion a flying speed, extra damage, and the ability to become a mount, the Ranger the ability to exhale or have the Drake exhale a 30-foot cone of damaging breath based on the Drake's damage type, and eventually the ability for the Drake to be a large creature that can fly while mounted and deals more damage, and the Ranger the ability to grant resistance to themselves or their Drake to incoming damage as a reaction a number of times equal to their proficiency bonus. It's easy to compare the Drake Warden subclass to the Beastmaster, as both gain a companion that fights alongside them. However, the key difference is that the Beastmaster's fighting style tends to revolve around their companion, whereas the Drake Warden's companion acts more independently in combat. All in all, if you want to have a Drake as a pet, a guaranteed mount, and a plethora of good damage options to boot, the Drake Warden Ranger is a really good subclass to go with. The Fey Wanderer is a ranger who protects both the mortal and Fey realms, using the magic of the Feywild to devastating effect. When taking this subclass, the ranger gains extra psychic damage on one weapon strike per turn, the Charm Person spell, which doesn't count against the ranger's known spells, can add their Wisdom modifier to Charisma checks, and gains proficiency in either Deception, Performance, or Persuasion. Further levels in this subclass grant more Fey Wanderer spells, advantage on saving throws against being charmed or frightened, the ability to charm or frighten creatures that are nearby if the Ranger or an ally makes a save against those same effects, the ability to cast the Summon Fey spell without using a spell slot once per turn, and eventually gains the ability to Misty Step with one nearby creature 
a number of times equal to their wisdom modifier. The Fey Wanderer is a suave ranger subclass that doesn't require them to spend additional ability score increases on their charisma to be a good face for the party. With more spell options and unique abilities that allow for creative gameplay, the Fey Wanderer can be a tricky subclass for newer players, but offers a lot of depth for more experienced rangers wanting unique solutions to their problems. Gloom Stalkers are at home in the murky depths of dim light, defending the darkness against the evils that lurk there. When taking this subclass, the Gloom Stalker gains the Disguise Self spell, the Dread Ambusher ability, and the Umbral Sight ability. Dread Ambusher lets the Ranger add their Wisdom modifier to their initiative rolls. On their first turn of combat, the Ranger's walking speed is increased by 10 feet, and if the attack action is taken, they can make one additional weapon attack that deals 1d8 extra damage if it hits. Umbral Sight grants the Ranger Dark Vision out to 60 feet, or if the Ranger already has Dark Vision, the range is increased by 30 feet. On top of that, the Ranger is invisible to other creatures that use Dark Vision while in darkness. Further levels in this subclass grant more Gloom Stalker spells, proficiency in Wisdom saving throws, the ability to attack again if a weapon attack misses once per turn, and eventually gains the ability to impose disadvantage on incoming attack rolls as a reaction if the incoming attack does not already have advantage. The Gloom Stalker is an extremely powerful subclass with insanely good options that all hinge on one unfortunate aspect, whether the campaign will have dark spots for the Gloom Stalker to lurk. Luckily, most D&D campaigns eventually go into caves and dungeons, so the Gloom Stalker is a good staple choice for rangers who want a more stealthy, roguelike ranger playstyle. Horizon Walkers focus their attention on extraplanar invaders, preserving the natural order of the planes by pursuing their foes across them. When taking this subclass, the ranger gains the protection from evil and good spell, the ability to detect nearby planar portals, and the planar warrior ability. Planar warrior lets the ranger choose a nearby creature as a bonus action, augmenting their next attack against that creature to deal force damage and deal an extra 1d8 damage. Further levels in this subclass grant more horizon walker spells, more damage from planar warrior, the ability to cast the Etherealness spell as a bonus action without using a spell slot once per rest, the ability to teleport up to 10 feet before each attack and do a third attack if the ranger targets two creatures while teleporting, and eventually gains the ability to resist all of an attacker's damage for that turn as a reaction. The Horizon Walker is still a damage-focused subclass, but one that focuses on teleporting around the battlefield, damaging multiple enemies at once. Even if there isn't a group of enemies available, their ability to deal extra force damage to single targets as a bonus action still gives them a lot of good damage potential, making the Horizon Walker a flexible damage dealer subclass that works in group fights as well as single target battles. Hunters are the last line of defense for the common folk versus the monsters and beasts of the wilderness, specializing their training to take down even the wildest of threats. When taking this subclass, the ranger can choose from one of three feats. Colossus Slayer, which lets the ranger deal extra damage when hitting a creature below its max hit points with a weapon attack. Giant Killer, which lets the ranger use their reaction to immediately attack a large or larger creature within 5 feet that misses an attack against the ranger, and Horde Breaker, which states once per turn when making a weapon attack, the ranger can make another weapon attack against a different creature within 5 feet of the original target and within reach of the ranger's weapon. Further levels in this subclass grant one of three potential defensive choices, one of two multi-attack options that focus on either ranged or melee multi-attacks, and eventually one of three superior defensive options. 
The Hunter is a simple subclass, but that doesn't mean it's bad. With two to three options every time a subclass ability is gained, the Hunter gives the Ranger an immense amount of versatility and replayability. While outclassed in stealth by the Gloomstalker and damage by the Horizon Walker, the Hunter is still a great base option for new players who want a simpler, easier to understand Ranger that carries good defensive options and can fit with any desired playstyle. The Monster Slayer focuses on hunting down the most dangerous of magical foes, trained in supernatural abilities to combat the likes of vampires, werewolves, and other magical threats. When taking this subclass, the Ranger gains the protection from evil and good spell, the Hunter's Sense ability, and the Slayer's Prey ability. Hunter's Sense allows the Ranger to sense if a creature has any immunities, resistances, or vulnerabilities as an action, and can be used a number of times equal to the Ranger's Wisdom modifier. These uses are regained upon finishing a long rest. Slayer's Prey lets the Ranger choose a nearby creature as a bonus action, augmenting their first attack per turn against that creature to deal an extra 1d6 damage. Further levels in this subclass grant more Monster Slayer spells, a bonus 1d6 to saving throws and grapple checks against a creature targeted by Slayer's Prey, the ability to magically foil nearby spells or teleportation as a reaction, and eventually gains the ability to use a reaction to attack a creature targeted by Slayer's Prey when they force the Ranger to make a saving throw, automatically succeeding on the saving throw if the reaction attack hits. The Monster Slayer is the simplest Ranger subclass, similar to the Hunter, but with a lot less of the variety. The Monster Slayer focuses on honing down single targets, designating one creature and gaining bonuses against them until they go down, and the Ranger can then target a new creature. This single target focus can still work really well in the party though, and the Monster Slayer is a good choice for Ranger players looking for a simple subclass that offers straightforward benefits to damage dealing. The Swarm Keepers are isolationist Rangers, choosing to bond with the spirits of nature to create swarms of these spirits and defend them as one would a family. When taking this subclass, the Ranger gains the Mage Hand Cantrip and Fairy Fire spell, as well as the Gathered Swarm ability. Gathered Swarm grants the Ranger a swarm with an appearance of their choosing, which can assist the Ranger once per turn in combat after hitting a creature with an attack to deal more damage to a target, move a target up to 15 feet horizontally, or move the Ranger up to 5 feet horizontally. Further levels in this subclass grant a bonus action flying and hovering speed of 10 feet for 1 minute, a buff to all the Gathered Swarm abilities, and eventually the ability to resist incoming damage and use the Swarm to teleport up to 30 feet away when the Ranger is hit. The Swarm Keeper is as utilitarian as the Ranger gets with unique swarm abilities to not only resist damage, but relocate the ranger and enemies around the battlefield. With no major decisions beyond which gathered swarm ability to use, the Swarm Keeper is a good subclass option for new and experienced players who want to focus on utility and mobility, but still have damage options to fall back on in a pinch. With all the class and subclass abilities explained, let's now look at how to build a ranger if you want to try one for yourself. With the ranger having quite a few options available, you can really build them a number of different ways depending on the campaign setting and what their main role in the party will be. For the purposes of this example, I'm going to build a level 1 archery focused ranger emphasizing ranged damage dealing that can eventually build into the Hunter subclass. For ability scores, we'll want our highest ability score to be Dexterity, to take full advantage of ranged weapons, a high initiative modifier, and more armor class from our light and medium armors. Our second highest ability score can either be Wisdom or Constitution. 
Wisdom will boost up our spellcasting modifiers, as well as how frequently we can use some abilities, whereas Constitution will help keep us alive with more hit points. Since my ranger is going to be focused on being a hunter, I'll choose my Constitution to be my second highest ability score, and Wisdom will be my third highest. The rest of the ability scores can be laid out as you see fit based on what you have available. After ability scores is health. To determine my ranger's starting health, I'll just take 10 and then add my constitution modifier to it. With health settled, let's move on to equipment. The ranger's starting equipment options give them a wide variety of things to play around with. And since I already know I want to focus on archery, I'll want to choose leather armor, a light armor that scales well with dexterity and doesn't impose disadvantage on stealth checks, two short swords, great finesse weapons that can use my dexterity while dual wielded, an explorer's pack, which has useful adventuring equipment to get us started, and a longbow and a quiver of 20 arrows, our bread and butter weapon option for our archery based ranger. Now that we have our equipment, let's note down our level 1 abilities that the ranger will have unlocked. At level 1, this just means that we have to choose a favored enemy and favored terrain for our ranger. Favored enemy can be entirely situational, and I would encourage any ranger player to talk with their DM about what choice would be good here since you really don't know what types of monsters you'll be running into. The best generalist options would be either Celestials, Fiends, or Undead, since there's so many of these monsters at various challenge ratings. But again, talking to your DM is going to be crucial here. Once we have a monster type chosen, we just note down that we have advantage on survival checks to track them, intelligence checks to recall information on them, and we gain one of their languages if applicable. For natural terrain, again, you'd really need to talk to your DM about this, because only they're going to know what type of terrains the party will be facing. Grasslands are always a safe bet, but you also get two more of these as you level up, so you can always add more terrains later on, based on what happens in the campaign and where the party ends up going. Once we have a terrain chosen, we just note down all the benefits it grants us for traveling in it, mainly that traveling, navigation, and foraging are all going to be a lot easier while in this terrain. So, with our ability scores, health, equipment, and level 1 abilities all laid out, we have a level 1 ranger ready to go. And that is everything you need to know about the Ranger class in D&D. A versatile half-caster that's a great mix between a fighter, rogue, and druid, they bring a lot to the table so long as they can tailor their choices with the DM to actually fit into the campaign setting. Now, Rangers have long since been thought of as one of the weaker classes in 5th edition, and while the added subclasses and alternative class options from newer sourcebooks do fix a lot of those inherent issues, what do you all think of the Ranger? Are they a good damage dealing option that more players should use, or are they just a bit too simple with what they provide? Let me know in the comments below, or join us over on the Altworld Discord, which is linked in the description, to discuss it with our community. While you're there, feel free to say hi and check out our live courses that we run every week for free that cover any and everything you could possibly need to know to play D&D. If you want to help support the server and this channel, you can also check out our Ko-fi page in the description. And since we've reached the end of all of the playable classes in D&D, that is everything I had for you. Thank you all so much for your time today. I appreciate all of you who support us here, and make sure to have a wonderful rest of your day. I'll see all of you next time.